My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Jim, we're going to be talking about the Preacher comics, When Preacher Becomes Preacher, Until the End of the World, issues 8 through 12. But first, what do you got for us? I have patreon.com slash Jim Rugg, and if you open those two pages, what I've been doing is a comparison between these two stories, Street Angel's Dog and Lost Dog. They're the, uh, the same story, and you can see how similar they are in the beginning. Uh, we enjoy doing those comparisons. This is where things change, and uh, this is what I did this week. I also dug out pages for this, so... I'm posting script, I'm talking about the differences between the two versions, showing the artwork, and I found all of my sketches and prep materials for the first issue, which is the first Street Angel I did at Image Comics, 22 pages of uh, layouts for these two pages, right. so I posted all of those. <laughs> um, I usually don't do that many, but it was the beginning of starting a new Street Angel series, so getting into a lot of process stuff, and that's again at patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. You Very can find cool. all of that. It's a, almost autobiographical, man. I think I learned something about a guy who's <laughs> laying out uh, two pages using uh, 22 pages of thumbnails. Red Room, issue one and two, available for pre-order at this very moment. Uh, thousands of people have ordered the first issue of Red Room, and we're trying to mimic those numbers with the second issue. And guess what? It's going to be a monthly comic, so get on the ball with that stuff. Your comic shop can now order Red Room issue number one, so if you want to go that route, let your, you let your store know they're going to be able to order you copies. But Jim, the task at hand today, man, we're talking Preacher Comics. This is... Uh, you, this is uh, issue 8 through 12 that we're going to be checking out. I got into the game probably like issue 18 or 19 and read it monthly, religiously, until uh, the completion. So we're going to use the trade paperback. And uh, for my money, the first seven issues, it was a good introductory piece. Get you to know the characters a little bit. But this is the first kind of big story that clues you into the, the preacher world. And, uh, and it's... A crazy 1990s romp of edge lord hardcore. How many atrocities can we get on the page? Kind of comics. In, in, in fact, Jim, uh, you're going to have some extra responsibility beyond <laughs> just your expertise in comics making and all of that. Uh, like the great old Monster Vision Joe Bob Briggs stuff and the things he's doing currently on, on Shudder. Uh, let's have a list of atrocities as we go, man. And that's going to be your responsibility, man. So as we as we go by and we see uh, different sorts of things that would make Frederick Wortham bristle, it's going to be your responsibility to record those for posterity, if you choose to accept that. Can <laughs> you handle might, that, Jim? We might need a bigger piece of paper. Right? <laughs> this is, uh, I always think of Preacher as like Garth Ennis's uh, analysis of American mythology. Sure. You know, it's cowboys, it's the West, it's religion, it's John Wayne. Uh, we're going to see all of it in this story, uh, front and center. And I read this like you, you know, when it was being published, I think I came on, I don't know, in the 40s or something. As soon as I started reading, I just read all the trades up to that point and then was reading it monthly, like through the end of it. Uh, really captured my imagination. Hadn't read comics quite like this, the way it reads and things. It's so over the top in a lot of ways, but also like I said, grounded in this like American mythology that a lot of, I think, outside of American creators often do. You know, it's almost like, what is what does the commercial version of America look like from the outside? Right. Uh, so I enjoy that aspect of it. And we'll point, that's one of the things that I'll be pointing out as we go through, because it's something I thought a lot about on this reread. It's strange to reread this story on its own, out of the context of the series, um, because it is depraved. You know, <laughs> I mean, this is some of the darkest shit comics wise. Uh, we talk about outlaw comics. This is like outlaw writing. It's shocking that Vertigo published something like this to me. It's 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 vulgar. It's dark. It's demented. Isn't it wild how like you sort of brought it up? The 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 Brits are into the Western mythos. Uh, you think about Mobius doing decades worth of blueberry comics uh like everybody cares some about of the best stuff. westerns are italian filmmakers right <laughs> like you and i grew up man our dads are watching those john wayne movies too much and we have one tv in the house so it's like i'm overdosed on that by age five do you think of preacher as a horror comic i do and i so i actually do think of it as an outlaw comic as well to be honest uh, one other thing I think about it in terms of this is what like in my top list of great collaborations between all people involved down to the Matt Hollingsworth color. They get another co uh, colorist late, later on. Don't remember the name, but you don't even have to look at the credits to tell that it ain't uh, Hollingsworth anymore. 
Yeah, it's pretty amazing that it's the same creators th for a monthly comic for, I think it's 66 issues or yeah, so that the like series it. runs. But I mean, that's a hell of a run in a, in a monthly comics production for to keep the same artist and writer together. Uh, it's remarkable. And it's good from the beginning. Like, that team doesn't take very long to round into shape. It's true. Uh, first off, before we get into the the bulk of the story, got to cut some promos on the book packagers here. Whoever the editors are and uh, whoever's responsible for, you know, collecting this into the trade. Because these are thoughtful crea creators that we have here. And the fact that this great page op story opener is on the left-facing page is going to throw off the rhythm of all the page turns moving forward. And, you know, the grandma is going to be revealed on this page. So you're tasked with turning the page, seeing that image, reading all of this. That's not the way it was in the uh -oh. issues. The uh, collections editor, whoever the fuck they are, is a big idiot. And also there are no credits here, which would have been in the issues. So you're just left with these big black boxes because they thought that was a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, and to say one more bit about the page turn thing, these are cliffhangers, these are spoilers. Um, you know, people reading at home or whatever may not think about it, but as a creator, you think, like, the page turn is your is your surprise. But if it's on the right-hand side, it's the ruining of the surprise. Exactly. And the way this story pops off, we're jumping back in time, right? 1974, young Jesse Custer. Uh, you see these hillbilly bumpkin dudes. They have Dad on the hook and... Page one, you open this comic and you will see a headshot. Uh, <laughs> a, a father getting murdered right in front of his child's face. So uh, I don't know about you, Jimmy, but I think that that would count as a as a uh, first mark on uh, our list of uh, atrocities. I'm calling that one a headshot. Could have been a murder, but we're going to see both as we go along. So, uh, And we're going to see more than one headshot. So I, I'm going to call this one a headshot because it's, uh, it's graphic and in the forefront. And... One of the things when I was rereading this, I, I was offended by by the violence, the you know the the darkness of this story, and I keep thinking like, this is just a fact. Like you're going out of your way to show this kind of demented storytelling, torturing this kid, torturing these characters for what purpose? And I think the purpose within Preacher is twofold. One is why is Jesse mad at God? Right. This really is why you would be mad at God, and and God is in this, you know, as a character. So. It kind of, to me, I think that's where this connects in terms of Preacher's bigger overall story and why you go to the lengths that Ennis goes to in, in torturing this character. So that was my justification for some of what we're going to see in terms of like how much can you really subject a character to. Jesse's, this is a max level of, of torture throughout yeah. this story, his origin, if you will. Yeah, that's goddamn right. I read this as a, as a kid and... Uh, I really felt for the character, you know, like I, I almost never feel anything with any comics I read, certainly from the big two. Uh, but this is like one of those affecting uh, co comics for me that came out within that system, which is super rare. So I'm not going to harsh. I'm not going to keep harshing on the screw up of the pagination, but I will make mention that like this. OK, so this is page one. And then there was a great kind of cliffhanger spread, which would be this page, you know, now. And it's modern day Jesse Custer, so you have the transition. Really great too, like little kid to the adult, same same point of view, same kind of composition. They're really good at this. This is kind of like the way they jump around in Time and Love and Rockets, the Hernandez brothers, where they'll repeat the characters, but like we're jumping to a party or There's teenage stuff. years or stuff like that. They do really well with that cutting back and forth through time. They in, do in this story. So so this would be on the left page, and then this would be on the right where he's, we discover that Jesse Custer's bound and uh, he's back home, man, with Grandma. So then you would turn the page and then it would launch into a little bit ago. Yeah, Ennis does a good job using time and, and showing us a little bit and then going back. It's, it, it builds a lot of suspense as you're reading this and wanting answers. The characters want answers. You know, this is whenever Tulip, Jesse's love interest, is going to learn about Jesse's background. So in a way... Uh, characters are experiencing the same thing we, the readers, are experiencing going through this. Now, now Jesse's going to get a little bit of a uh, intro story for Tulip leading us off because when they get reintroduced in the first part of Preacher, she's a hitman, hit woman, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we don't know how that happened. Uh, she wasn't that way when Jess was first with her, so we're getting that origin story right here. 
Yeah, she's a fun character. I, I really like the first read through Preacher. It was the characters. I just True. fell in love with all of them. Uh, even the, These characters are, a lot of them, despicable, but they're still very enjoyable because of the amount of development. Like They're very three-dimensional, these characters, way even into the supporting ranks of the cast. Tulip got put up, got offered uh, some, some opportunities, but then uh, you read about this in like articles about human trafficking at a certain point the the guy who's giving you all that help it ain't for free he wanted her to to pay off uh sex with him it was it was his plan on how to pay off her debt ah right 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 and uh she's like i'm not doing that he offers her the opportunity to do to do hits as a joke and she's like oh yeah i know how to shoot guns boom you're hired that's like that classic American thing. Yeah, fun, you see that? fun pacing and payoff. <laughs> see, if this was done uh, in a timely fashion on in film, this would be Cynthia Rothrock or somebody. Good, good call. <laughs> uh, Steve Dillon does something with the drawing that I call like a barrel. When I was learning to draw faces, I, I once saw somebody demo this, and it's this idea of there's a cylinder like for your, your mouth unit on a face. He really draws that with uh certainly with with jesse the main character you're gonna see it and now that i pointed it out you'll see it throughout but it really is this cylinder that makes up the mouth area of the face in terms of planes and shadows and stuff right you're talking about like this yes. piece right there that little poofer yeah you'll see it throughout um it's it's very pronounced but it's it's one of those like it just brought me back to i don't know i was probably 12 or something whenever i saw this as a demo or read it in the book good storytelling here we have uh jesse and tulip He's got the word of God. That's his deus ex machina weapon. And they're going to go see her old boss because she still is in debt to that character. He wants her to do some jobs. So he's going to go in there and uh, take care of business. But there's this rickety ass scary van. You, We all know that if you see a van like that in a parking lot, it's up to no good. And uh, dialogue bubble coming straight from the van. Holy fucking dog shit. By the way, I think it is. I criticize whenever we see grays and browns used for color. I always criticize them. When you want a van to recede into the background of a of a scene, perfect use of gray. Yeah, yeah. Hollingsworth is dope. Like he really like the conversations about his work really came to the forefront with like the David A. Hawk collaborations on uh, Hawkeye. But this is strong, strong coloring. It's certainly as an early effort of computer coloring. Uh, this is in tandem with like extreme sacrifice and stuff like that. But it's like <laughs> that's your context for computer coloring. Going to confront the uh, the hitman boss, Jesse Custer's about to use the word of God. Well, boom, Jody kicks in. We you might not a hundred percent recognize him from this panel when you're reading this thing through, but when you see Jesse's dad get shot in the head and you see the guy with the half ear, there's the half ear right there, man. It's the same guy. Do we ever learn why he has a half ear? We do. And that's in a one shot that, uh, okay. uh, that we're definitely going to check out at a later date because I think you would love it, especially if you've never read it. I have not. Carlos yeah, Escares, is, Carlos Escares draws it. And it's like a 64 page movie that would be the perfect canon film. For anybody at home that's unfamiliar with Preacher, this word of God gimmick is Jesse has the ability to tell people what to do. And you see how it's used here. It'll be red letters or whatever to indicate that he's using that that power. Um, and Volume 1 establishes where that's coming from in the setup, and it's an integral part of the series. One thing that confuses me about this story is, well, let's go. In a couple pages, I'll, I'll, I'll explain the confusing part for me. This reminds me of Cable from Extinction Agenda, Jim Lee kicking in the door of the danger room. I know, another another <laughs> kicking gimmick. Uh, Jim... Why don't you log us on our list of atrocities? <laughs> How about just graphic violence? <laughs> I could do murders. Murders. That's, that sounds good to me, man. And that is two. <laughs> yeah, at a certain time, at a certain point, we should do like hash marks. <laughs> Make it three since uh, Jesse's dad <laughs> caught, caught, caught the gimmick, man. So the word of God, Jesse can say it, use it, and people do whatever... He, he I don't want to cut good. you off, Ed, but I'm going to make it four since this is the third hitman to, to go down. In yeah, scene. makes makes per, makes perfect sense. So Jesse's going to use the word of God on Jody. He's going to use it double time, and that shit ain't work. And you see that sneer on Jody's jibs. Uh, this is where I'm confused. Mm -hmm. What protects them? Why doesn't the word of God work on them? I don't know if that's ever clearly explained. It is, and it's because at Anvil or Angelville, 
God is on their side, the grandma's side. So, it, and we'll f- jump forward to it. When God brings Tulip back, and he's basically like, it's all a, a scam to try to get on Jesse's good side to get him off his heels. God tells Tulip, and you know what? I I lifted that order of protection. He can use his word of God on them again. That's fair. Yeah. R- remind us to revisit that when we hit that spot, because there's one more detail there about uh, the way God works that I think will be relevant to this. It's super cool. Uh, the other thing that's great, and, and we've covered it in several comics, uh, it's it's sort of that mark of, of great writing in these kind of pulp confines, where the word of God thing is deus ex machina. Like, you could accomplish anything if you could tell somebody to do something. Uh, there was like Akira when Kaneda gets that super, super uh, high caliber laser weapon and the battery just doesn't work. We looked at Extinction Agenda. Warlock can turn into anything and rescue everybody super easy. So you have to like get him out of the story right away. The Deus Ex Machina worked for seven issues for Jesse Custer to be able to get whatever the heck he wanted. Uh, he was on his high horse earlier about this. Uh, he tried to use it three times so far. It isn't working. If I'm following this month after month, and then I come to this issue, I'm riveted, man. That's true. It does put him in a real vulnerable position. Hey, open this spine enough to see this guy's face because it reminds me of a Corbin drawing. It does, And yeah. I like I like Dylan's art, and it's very deceptive. The first time I saw Preacher, I was, like, unimpressed. Mm-hmm. And then once I started reading it, I become a fan because it works so well. Storytelling works so well, great with faces and expressions. But it's interesting to me whenever you see a little bit of I don't know, influences possibly there or commonalities. Maybe they're influenced by similar people. Their approach is similar, but that one really stands out to me. Jesse Custer's also a a tough bastard, and he is in such fear of these two guys right here. And I think that that's established super clearly and adds another element of intrigue for the reader where it's like, this is badass. He's tough, but he's really freaked out by these guys. I got to know why, especally this little skinny chick, chicken fucking fucker. (laughs) <laughs> you know how can you be scared of that guy yeah. literally yeah yeah that'll be on our list of atrocities as th- the time comes yes it will <laughs> so jesse's uh going back home these little hillbilly guys they were tasked with with finding our guy i'm gonna do burning crosses as atrocity i feel like that's a uh, crossing a line you know it's funny that headshots is uh number one on our list jimmy because uh i do think that you should just uh add just Let's call it blasphemy. That should be with uh, <laughs> maybe even the title. That might be thousands. <laughs> oh, you don't have to do hash marks. <laughs> just uh, just a broad overview. But look at that ominous place. Like I think about like say you're you're hiking in the woods or something, and then you just come across this kind of colonial looking plantation type, you know, house or something. Like you just know that bad shit is happening. Also, given the fact that these guys just ritualistically every night just burn a couple crosses on their front yard uh that's a statement yeah i think that's a little bit of uh ennis cutting promos on america <laughs> yeah maybe or certainly just religion you know like he there's a he has a lot of religious issues that he's been exercising over the course of his career but they're back home and uh once again i'll just call attention to the fucked up pagination yeah uh because if page one was where page one should be this would have been a page two, uh, a page turn reveal. That would have been incredible. Yeah, as soon as you turn that page, you go straight to her. Right. So it's, it, it does really mitigate the previous page. The first issue that I got my hands on was a one shot that takes place after the two stories that are in here, and we're just going to look at the first the first story this time. Uh, but the uh, issue that I first read was a one shot about um, the origin of the fuck communism uh, zippo lighter yeah that's a nice object throughout this story I like the open panels this is something i've become conscious of since bill griffiths talked about it sure uh, but having those open panels it's another one of those super subtle things but steve dillon just really nails all of these little pieces you know and, and it's almost like we say it with lettering if you're good at lettering it's invisible you just kind of keep on reading in a weird way, every part of the creative process is that way. If you're good at it, you're just in the story with these characters. You right. know, and I think Steve Dillon's artwork is that way where if you don't stop and really appreciate it, you can just get lost in this story. It's going to happen. The comments saying, like, what's Ed doing there with uh, the grandma? <laughs> so uh, 
you know, we'll just put that on Front Street right now. Jody, he's a tough bastard. Would you call that domestic violence, violence against women? Sure. How, how do I list that on my atrocity list, Ed? <laughs> violence against women is sounds sounds fine. Oh, and I don't know if it was clear on that previous page, but Jody has the light that cigarette lighter, yes. which we are going to continue to see throughout this storyline. Right. Yeah, very good call. What is Jesse Custer's hair, by the way? He has some kind of like jerry curl or something. <laughs> Yeah, mostly when they refer to it, it's about how it's jet black. Yeah. Uh, but it, it definitely has a little bit of... Some, some mousse some in it or something. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, yeah, he's got something going on. It looks wet all the time. We're, be we're beating Jesse Custer down, man. We're going to just tear him completely down. He's It's that thing where, you know, your parents will always be able to press your buttons no matter how old you are. Uh, and it captures that in these sequences here. Very well. Even from the time he gets loaded into the van, whenever you say this is a badass and look how, how meek he is, it's that regression to childhood. Right. Which is, imagine having that in a script and trying to depict it. Sure. I mean, that's that's some impossible shit. Like, actors can't do that, you know? That's, that's high-level everything. Ennis is great at subtle facial expressions. We see it just even on this spread here, man, looking down like a punk. Uh, this right here, man, that little Judge Dread mouth. Like when we see it with, with Judge Dread, uh, it's badass stuff. But this, he's like biting his bottom lip, trying not to cry in front of his girl. Yeah, man, they're so depraved. So this is one of those instances, right? The plan here for them, and this is what the grandmother tells him. I'm going to give you the night with Tulip. By the way, it's not a night to like ha have your last romantic moments. They're tied up in chairs. And then tomorrow I'm going to kill her in front of you. Yeah. So that's what's going on in Jesse's head. Why he, Maybe why he's fighting back some tears there. <laughs> and by the way, we saw on page one, it's not the first time his loved one has been killed in front of him. So uh, he knows what to expect. Yeah. And the last page of that issue is God grabbing an old lady by the face and giving her... Uh, confessional, communion, whatever you call that. Boom, launch into page one of the next one. Our, our pagination is back, Jimmy. Yeah, I was I was happy to see that return. And we have the origin of uh, how Jesse's parents uh, conceived him, essentially. The origins of a a Anvil, Angelville. And this is how you start stories. What's the moment? Like, you know, they say, like, cut, cut in late, you right. know, whenever you start a scene or whatever. To me, that's master storytelling because you're figuring out there's a million ways to, to do this scene. Are any of them that provocative and attention grabbing? Like they you see that, this. you want to know what the next panel is. They are great at this, man. Uh, almost the first page of every issue is just pulls you right in. And we have uh, Jesse Custer's dad is coming home from, from Vietnam. Uh, this lady has hitched a ride. She's running away from home couple of hippies picked her up and sort of filled her mind up she's lost she's they, she's she could be indoctrinated into a cult with how how mushed up her brains are at this point so these people that she was hitch, hitching with man, they put all these negative thoughts about you know the veterans of the vietnam war and stuff into her mind so she was just she was on board and trying to impress these people <laughs> right but immediately felt guilty. How many times have you done that sort of thing in your, in your young life oh, where, where you do something and then two seconds later you're like, ah, oh, especially when it good. has to do with another person and you see the effects of whatever cruelty joke, uh, even if it's well-intentioned and goes wrong. Yes, of course you feel that remorse. And then you get a nice wordless sequence to kind of sum up that. Right. Pretty well done. Good tool in the uh, in the cartoonist toolbox to go wordless like that. He builds the relationship. I, I think I think everything that we feel is well-earned. Uh, in terms of how the relationship happens, how their relationship evolves, and uh, it makes you feel for these characters enough that when things are getting ripped up, uh, you feel it, man. Yeah, he's really good at that. That's the subtlety of this series that seems like it's all kind of bells and with spit on the face, violence, but it is the personal relationships and the characters that I said in the beginning. I fell in love with all these characters. These are a couple more of that supporting cast where it's like it's not hard to get behind them. What a weird uh, panel composition that is. I don't have much else to say, but it stood out when I read it. It stands out now seeing it again. Just kind of an odd an odd choice. Because of the cropping of the eye, the cropping of the mouth. Yeah, and we're going to see a character, another character who's close to Jesse, young Jesse, yeah. and, that has one eye. So Get your get your Sharpie ready when we introduce <laughs> that guy. So I don't know if it's, uh, you know, if we're seeing some parallels and foreshadowing there, but it's, it's, it is an unusual panel. Where are we at on our list of atrocities, Jimmy? Pull that into the cam, man. So we have headshots, couple of murders, man, burning crosses, blasphemy, violence against women. Let's keep this gravy train rolling. 
continuing the origin story between uh, with uh, Jesse Custer and Tulip, uh, the conception of Baby Jesse, man. While uh, this lady, she's uh, the daughter of uh, mm -hmm. that grandma that we just right. saw. She was conceived uh, when that grandma that we saw earlier was 66 years old, man. So that's just like another level of weirdness that we're getting in the game. Yeah, there's an emphasis on bloodlines and keeping those bloodlines together, which I think is there are conspiracy theories around bloodlines. There's religion, lots of religion. I mean, chapters in the Bible that are just so-and-so begot so-and-so for, for chapters. Uh, it's a really important piece, I think, from Ennis' point of view of what he's crafting here with the mythology, with the connections to religion. So we have our war hero, we have our damsel in distress, let's add some stakes, we got a baby, we got a kid, uh, but we got a powerful guy that would be, on paper, strong enough to protect his old lady. But this is Preacher Comics, so we know that's not going to be the case, man. In fact, on page one, we saw him get his head blasted, so we're going to, it's like the Titanic, man. We know what the end is, man. Let's uh, follow the journey leading up to it. Young Jody and TC. Uh... That's another thing that Dylan is really great at, is taking some age off the characters. He does it with young Jesse, not even just like to this extreme when he's a little boy, but I'm saying when he's like a young teenager, he slightens up his body a lot, softens the face a touch. It's all subtle, but it all works, man. So we have the first examples of uh, Jody catch catching wreck, and little Jesse, man, is impressed with it. He's there watching, so he has certain... Uh, Disrespect for these cats. Go back one page. Yeah. I hate to do this, but two two points. One is this cowboy hat, because we are going to see more of the cowboy mythology in this particular story. And then two, Dylan flexing some of his muscles that you don't always see. He's so good with facial expressions, and so much of this story is told through these facial expressions. But now and then you get to see a burst of action. That works pretty well for me. And it's a dramatic panel, like the pause in the middle of that punch being thrown. It just, it works, and it's, I, I think it speaks to Dylan's ability as an artist. Yeah, if this was a Zack Snyder movie, like, this would be paused in the movie, and then a bullet time punch to the yeah. jibs right there. Right. <laughs> the facial expressions <laughs> when these guys get wrecked, man. TC, the chicken, the fish fucker, will have a couple of good ones when he gets kicked in the yam bags, man. Here's the bloodlines, man. You can see that this family, this Louise Cajun family, they go back quite a ways. <laughs> So Jody and TC, man, they get hold of uh, Jesse's dad, his mom, and uh, little Jesse. It's it's a shock that the the baby exists because of those the importance of those bloodlines. Something tells me that uh, maybe maybe uh, Jesse's mom was supposed to marry a cousin or something like this, man. But they have what they have now, so the grandma has to make it work. And this kind of marriage photo <laughs> is perfect. It's a far shot. You don't even get to see the faces close up, but you could tell this married couple is not happy. They're using, they're wearing like some kind of traditional attire that is of her choosing because we didn't see anything close to this kind of attire and anything they were wearing otherwise. And uh, that little sailor outfit, that's just the icing on the cake, man. Probably a little slap in your Marine son-in-law's face. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jarhead. <laughs> And note to Matt Hollingsworth there, you know, his flashbacks aren't all in grays. He's choosing to do that at this, uh, you know, what traditionally would be many people's happiest day of their life. Not with that color. So with this spread, uh, this is the moments leading up to page one that we saw with the, with the headshot. They're going to try to make the break for it and end it up with my daddy get shot in the head. So we've seen that happen. I like that setup too because... We don't need to see them make their run for it and get caught by the people following them. It's all there in one sentence. Totally effective. Gives us all the information we need. We know how that ends. We don't need to explain it all by panel by panel of a couple people running, a couple more people running after them. So let's so let's add more kind of creepiness to the Jody character. He just killed the kid's dad. He's calling him a fucking little crybaby. Just a cold, callous, sick bastard. And this is the last time I ever cried. <laughs> Young Jesse, man, just staring at him. And you see, it's an older face than we than we saw before. You know, he's getting bigger. You know that this is That's dicey. Bad news. Yeah, like you know that this is a dicey thing. You can't. If there's a happy moment in a Garth Ennis comic, you know it's not going to be happy for long. Jim, I need you to get your sharpie ready <laughs> because we're going to be introducing Jesse's best friend from childhood, Billy Bob. 
This character right here, man. He's the Boba Fett of the Preacher series, man. Everybody loves him. <laughs> and, uh, the, of course, the reason why uh, you need to break out your pen is because uh going to marry my sister, Lori. We'll call that incest. Yeah, I think we would call that incest for sure. And it's so, it's so depraved, so bizarre. Like, he's laying it out like, yeah, we keep our bloodlines pure. My, my mom and dad are brother and sister. And uh, Jesse Custer's like, oh man, I don't have a sister. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then, uh, and then our uh, little Cyclops is like, oh, don't worry. Like you, you don't have to marry your sister. You could still get married. And then flash forward to uh, Sunday school for Jesse Custer. And for, for him, what that is, is his, his purple skinned grandma is going to be putting uh those dogmatic thoughts into his mind. Uh, you have a special friend named God. He knows everything you're thinking, and he's watching you every second of the day. Isn't that beautiful? No, it kind of scares me, Grandma. <laughs> you're going to learn to love Jesus, son. I don't completely connect with her motivation with religion. That part is, is one of the things that I don't know if I get out of the story. Uh, you know, keep your eyes peeled. Maybe that it appears somewhere. But it, it's not clear to me that her motivation is power, money, status, you know, how it all links into like, why is this something she cherishes? And I get it. Well, people are religion because are religious because they're religious in some cases, but it is dogmatic. Like she is making him learn the Bible one page every day. You know, she is training him to be a preacher. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm not sure where that comes from based on everything else we see with her, with Jody and TC. Like, why didn't she try to turn them into preachers? You know, it's, it doesn't totally make sense to me that, that bit, but, uh, Maybe not important. The importance is the connection to God that she connects Jesse with, because it's like while these atrocities are destroying his life, it's also your friend God is there with you every step of the way, son. <laughs> so you know, like you, you, it, it makes sense to me as an adult why Jesse is so motivated to ask God some questions about these things that have happened to him. I'm not as mo I'm not as clear on the motivation of Grandma really being that dogmatic about it yeah that, that's that's fair uh we can't let the reader forget about jesse's uh dog now that he has a, has a best friend got to keep establishing that puppy that that they uh that he so cherishes even though he's given more time to billy bob right at this moment and that might not be a good thing for the uh lifespan of the puppy uh this this wooden fence kind of plays a part in the story as we move forward too it shows up a couple of times but uh we have a little dog humping going on. I'm going to flip the page. And Jimmy, I see you busted your Sharpie out because you knew it was coming. Yes. I was trying not to look. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thought I would distract myself. Didn't really work. I am relieved that it's not a long, long torture scene. <laughs> right, sure. <laughs> so thank you for that, Garth. <laughs> we have young Jesse Custer running up, about to fight uh, Jody. Um, at a certain point... We're going to have to uh, add, add uh, child abuse to uh, our list of... Yeah, I think I missed that earlier. It should have <laughs> probably been added much earlier. <laughs> uh, there, it'll, it'll be very clear uh, so, soon enough because Jesse just used... <laughs> and this is just the depravity of the, the place that they're living at, man. Uh, pierced a dog's head through, through a fence, but little Jesse called him a cocksucker or, or, or no, f f dirty fucker, blah, blah, blah. And grandma heard it. So he's going to go to the coffin. And this is one of those sick things, man, where mama knows exactly what that is, man. And it is jumping into maternal instinct and is like over my dead body, man. You are not putting my boy in that coffin. Let you believe that, you know, maybe she... She caught a couple of... Yeah, no, no doubt about it. Some time in the gimmicks. By the way, the dog's name, Duke... Keep that in mind. We're going to see another Duke uh, yeah. throughout this series and in, in, in this particular story. Yeah, and even before this, man, a lot of John Wayne references uh, between uh, Jesse and his dad. So there's a big connection there. And uh, this is the last that Jesse ever sees of his mom. So that's like a POV shot. The backgrounds of uh, these Preacher comics, knowing that Ennis is penciling, inking 22 pages at the very least. Dylan. Sometimes it's, yes, Dylan, my bad. Penciling and inking uh, tw 22 pages at the very least. Sometimes the store is 24, 25 pages. Sometimes there's double pa double uh, size issues. He's doing it all. And uh, the spare backgrounds, I think, are very noteworthy because what he includes 
is all that you need, man. There's no major flourish. Like when you're in those city sequences, you're getting the things you need, man. You're getting a couple of trucks to let you know that there's some life in, in that sequence. You're getting the bare bones of the building. And it's 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 perfect. You don't need any more. We can talk about Hollingsworth's colors once again here. Um, again, I rail against these kind of muted palettes that are used. And you see it here. These are essentially grays in the background. The difference is the foreground, we have a saturated green. We have the, the flesh tones that are saturated. So he's using that muted gray color background as a background. All you right. know, I'm using muted colors so that that part recedes and the, and the saturated parts pop forward. You know, have some of the saturated parts if you're going to do those muted pieces. But I think it's really well done there. Um, and the blues is a contrast to the warm flesh tones. So it's kind of double dipping in, in a really strong color there and subtle color. Jim, how I learned to love the Lord. I'm going to need you to bust out that Sharpie because uh, the way they punish kids down there in Louisiana is they put them in a coffin. <laughs> they put some weights on it, drop them into the bottom of the bayou, have a couple of tubes, I guess just for air so that the kid can breathe down there. But, uh, that's what, that's what you get for punishment, a little MK Ultra sensory deprivation. As nightmarish as that is, how similar to, uh, uh, you know, like somebody in prison or whatever that gets thrown into... Solitary. Solitary confinement, right? It's the same exact concept. Yeah, a little more confined space. Yeah. Uh, right there. And when they pulls them out, let's... Uh, another shot to Hollingsworth, man. Yeah, like, man, look at this. All this... Blinded by the light. These, uh... You never saw this this pink... Uh, color used in uh, Preacher up to this point. Looks like a zombie. You know, there's your human, this is what flesh color looks like, and that's his color. It's that gray, pink, it, it's a zombie. Yeah. And it's the same as Grandma. It is the same as Grandma. Look at, uh, Steve Dillon was reading his X-Force comics, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> taking a look at that early uh, Rob Liefeld uh, inking job, man, where it would be the hatching on the sockets. But poor Jesse, man, he spent some time down there. Uh, he'll he'll have three three tours of duty in the casket underneath there, and it's exceeding amounts of time. I think he did a week here. It's a fortnight the next time. What's a fortnight? Two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is a cool panel. One, it's it's a nice contrast with her lack of eyes, and it is. Uh, it reminds me of Clockwork Orange. Whenever you're prying the eyes open, like you're gonna look. Yeah. So guess what, man. Jesse Custer's uh, more than happy to learn of, about uh, Jesus, or excuse me, God. Well, he has nobody else. Mom and dad now are both, mom, dad, and the dog now are all gone. Plus, and uh, all he's got left, Billy Bob. Yes, and flash forward a couple of years, and this is what I'm talking about, man. You, this isn't the Jesse Custer yeah, that we've, we've been seeing. He's, uh, he's, he's fit, but he's not, you know, as big as he will be. There's a little softness to the face. Uh, our Billy Bob is a little older. He's got a more pronounced jawline. TC's hair is receding a touch more. You know, they're able to communicate. I see Barry Windsor Smith in these faces, in the face constructions, the little bit of hatching on the cheeks. Um, I see Steve McNiven too. And I think that maybe the, the convergence point is Barry Windsor Smith that these guys are all looking at or, or drawing from. Um, but I really see it sometimes. And, and that face stands out to me. Jim, on our list of atrocities, uh, did you yet put uh, bestiality? Because we have a caption here, came the day that TC fucked the chicken. And this is a <laughs> this is a big moment. You know what? We messed up because whenever uh, Duke is killed, they're talking about him him uh, catching a fish and cutting a slit in it. Right. So I'm going to put bestiality down for two. <laughs> so Billy Bob's allowed to sleep over, but he has to stay out in the barn. TC doesn't know that he's out in the barn, man, and he's about to go make relations with this with this chicken. Yeah, Grandma doesn't let Billy Bob stay in the house. Right. <laughs> and let's just take everything away from Jesse Custer, man. Right. The his last uh, his last person or, or thing that cares about him. Not anymore. Yeah, that is harrowing, right? You don't exactly see it happen, but clearly know what happened at that point. And this is where young Jesse becomes unhinged, man. You see what I mean about getting kicked in the gimmicks? That's a good one. That's a good facial expression. Finally, we're all building toward this, right, man? The uh, squaring off between young Jesse Custer and Jody. But it sort of works just like the headshot gimmick. This is the past, so we know that whatever's about to happen isn't going to be that effective. So let's watch it play out. 
And this is pretty brutal stuff, man. When Jesse gives him all all he's got, Jody hits him with one punch after a smirk, and then you have six panels of applying that pressure on that crippler cross face, chicken wing, submission hold, six panels. So he's just holding the same pose, six panels, until ksh, crack. I think of it as the hammer lock. Yeah. And uh, George the Animal still used to lift dudes up in that. Oh. When you're a kid and you're doing wrestling moves to each other, Hammerlock hurts bad. Sure. That was one of those really convincing uh, finishing moves to see somebody do, and it was real hard to understand how their arm didn't didn't do this. Right. Uh, yes, got a fortnight because he called uh, Jody a, a cocksucker, man. Got a fortnight in the coffin this time, and this is him coming out with that emaciated, gaunt, gross, anemic-looking skin. And when Jesse gets out, man, he kind of breaks out a little bit, goes to the family of Billy Bob, and... Uh, you know, confesses that uh, Billy Bob's no longer with us, Ben. And you see multi-generations of the mm -hmm. Billy Bob family. And you could tell those generations apart by uh, eye placement. These feel like caricatures. Like when you have the books on how to do caricatures and it's like exaggerate whatever feature. And if eyes are a little bit too close, you really scrunch them together. That's what you have here. <laughs> <laughs> and it's you, really kind of funny cartooning out of context. Yeah, you got normal lady. Got the close together eyes, Mr. So that's a generation removed. Grandma. From grandma. <laughs> and then you have the uh, little Cyclopean young lady who would have, she's a widow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, kayfabers, we're still just in that origin phase, man. Tulip is still tied up. Jesse's still tied up. And he's just, he's just, uh, you know, dropping science, man. Tell, telling her everything that led up to them meeting. And that's what we have here, man. Young Tulip, different haircut. Has that haircut that my mom had about 1992. This is the story for me of, of the knife turn here. This is t twisting that knife that's already been stabbed into Jesse several times. As we go through this story, ugh, it just elevates the torture part. Yeah, because they clearly are a young couple in love, uh, developing the relationship more and more, getting very excited about all the possibilities uh, of the future. They're totally in sync. They click so well. There they are fucking in the This is desert. your art team. So the color is really nice here and you see the color contrast. But if you saw this in black and white, it would be equally effective. Like you see how much black ink is on the pages in the present. Um, works Black and white works in color. Yes. Yes. So we have this sequence right here, man. We're talking hopes and dreams. Hey, baby, what, what about uh, if we go to California? She loves that idea. Loves that idea. She's going off, get some cigarettes or something like that. Uh, it's a very quick, you know, she's supposed to be going five minutes, man. So he's sitting here and uh, just to root this uh, comic in a period of time, Forrest Gump is out. You know, Forrest <laughs> Gump is in pop culture. <laughs> so we have to have that sequence, man. And then sitting there, total bliss. Great shot. And then pull the camera back. Just through his peripheral vision, man. He knows who these goofs are. Might even be able to smell those fuckers, man, who are sitting on that bench right next to him. Complete silence, man. Tulip comes back, nobody at the bench. This is great. This is like that famous Vietnam photo with the gun to the guy's head, and right. then you learn that that's actually all staged. So if, if your camera was 10 feet further back, you get this. Right. It's good storytelling, good one-two panel punch. But this is the pain, because this is where Tulip learns what what happened you know like in her mind she turns into a raging alcoholic after she comes back and the bench is empty and spends the next several years hating jesse for this and now she learns why and it's like wow did he make the right decision for her protecting her all that hatred just misplaced but don't don't get too comfortable <laughs> so issue one we saw that uh jesse was a uh, conflicted preacher He's getting drunk, getting crazy, man, talking mad shit, going to the bar, picking fights. So this is the origin, like, leading up to that. When Jody and TC get hold of him, he gets a month in the coffin that time. And and uh, at long last, that's when I learned to truly love God. Comes this preacher in that little, that little uh, church that we saw get blasted when Genesis uh, came through. And that's everything leading up to issue one of Preacher. Now we get the part where Tulip was like, oh, baby, like, you know, 
I'm so sorry. I was hating you for so long, but it's almost like you could hear the footsteps. And that is the knife turn. Yeah. Th this moment when Tulip really pr probably loves him more than any other time in their history. Is this is this pagination different? I wonder if this is a left a left page. It, it has in a to comic be, right? book, you can do ad, there were ads running in the regular monthly comics, so that may have affected it. But yeah, this this would have been a uh, that would have been a right uh, right over here. Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah I do I think know. this would have been there. But it nevertheless, this is a better left hand page than right hand page because, like, when you see this. <laughs> S skip this <laughs> right like how you, you can't unsee that and this is just brutal too man yes. it's like you got overspray from the exit wound and then just pulling how about another for the headshot there jimmy yes <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you get sucked into the story and forget to update the list of atrocities <laughs> where are we at with the list man where are we at with the list a couple of headshots boom two bestiality gimmicks of child abuse animal cruelty incest uh it's going to escalate we're going to keep going uh but at this point the brainwashing is in full effect. You just see this dazed figure, Jesse Custer, not moving panel after panel, just staring. And she is reveling in the fact that he is a beaten man. He's yeah. done. It's over for him. Good job drawing this, Steve Dillon. What, is a, what does a defeated person look like? Good job with the expressions. Absolutely. This grandma is so nasty. This is where we get to see a touch of uh, jo Jody's motivation, man. Uh, because the grandma is putting so much time and effort into that boy. And, you know, he's a good soldier. He's going to do whatever he can. But, like, you get some sense that there's something going on behind those eyes there. Tulip isn't dead for too long, man. She wakes up in a different room. And uh, she's going to be talking with a, a higher power in a second. Which is... a. Uh... A pretty nice gift Ennis gives the readers, because I believe that's all the same issue. Like, he doesn't leave us a month thinking that she's dead. But, of course, there are questions. As a exactly. storyteller, it's like, well, how does this work? Yeah, you want to know what's going to happen. So we have the part with uh, TC and Jody talking, and this is where you get Jody talking about, you know, I give her my, my loyalty. I do all this stuff for her. But she always talks about that boy, and he's such a pussy. He's such a wuss. You know, if he was my boy, I would have beat his ass a lot more, toughen him up. I think Jody was uh, doing those push-ups before he shot this scene, man. He is pumped up in the panel. Yeah, for sure. Look at his mullet. <laughs> <laughs> mullet and a skullet. And uh, this is when John Wayne shows up and is like, you know what? Those guys are kind of right. You're being a bitch. You got business to do. Is this the first time that we see the John Wayne character? Did he appear in Volume 1? He did. He did. I think he even appeared in, in Issue 1. Okay. Uh, certainly one of the early issues. But we're going to get, you know, this is the origin of that even. I remember this part as being so bizarre. Yeah. You know, like you're reading Preacher. And this chapter, as we as we go through it, it's like, this is John Wayne hanging out with him. Yeah. It's really weird. And it's funny how they depict him. You know, you see his face in shadows. This is the equivalent of Naked Wolverine in Weapon X, where it's like certain parts have to stay in shadows. We can't actually use John Wayne's face. Right. And but, wow, it's kind of a cool a cool uh, concept. The, the silhouettes, more often than not, like, Dylan captures a John Wayne oh, yeah. silhouette. Like, you I, you could guess that that's John Wayne. And, and I watched you see, a lot of John Wayne movies growing up. <laughs> when you see a profile, like it, it, it passes feels like mustard. It, and also, you know, fuck the book collections editor. Got to say it again, man, because why not just have the career? Like, why yeah. not just leave everything as These is? These guys make something exceptional and you erase out their names. Good job. You know, like how much does the book collecting editor actually do? And yeah. one of your few decisions, one of the few visible decisions is let's black out everybody's name. <laughs> yeah. And just because a big chunk of black is better than you know, what was there. Fucking idiots, man. The One of the bizarre parts of this is that uh, in times of need, Jesse Custer has a, a uh, an invisible friend. An invisible friend that he made in the coffin. That's all he's got left, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> he, he needs all, he, he needs somebody. It's this guy or Jesus. So, uh, this is fun. This, to me, reminds me of uh, uh, Batman. You know, call back to, like, Batman origin of having movies. And I think it also is a nod to what this story is, the, the nod to American mythology and myth-making. There's the first uh, interaction between Jesse and uh, John Wayne. <laughs> and John Wayne's helping him get through his tenure in solitary confinement in the box. This is this is smart. This is why. Because, like, there is no light in there, but... 
but Dylan is giving you a little something so that you can see him, but it's still not, you know, sunlight. The big kind of motivating force of the entire series is that Jesse Custer knows that God has taken a powder and he wants to know why. He wants to confront him. Look, God has no nipples. Uh, or pupils. Or pupils. Uh, so Jesse's on the hunt. And that's uh, Tulip's along for the ride. And so is uh, Cass Cassidy. So here's the gimmick that God is going to put forth, man. She gets killed in front of Jesse Custer. But God wants Jesse off his trail. He's going to bring Tulip back. That's that's the That's the gimmick here. I love this depiction, and I love how much of a difference this feels compared to what we've seen up to this point. You know, things have been very grounded, you know, very uh, neutral colors in the background, you know, flesh tones, all this stuff. When God shows up, that yellow, the white, the different lighting, it feels supernatural. It right. feels like something different is going on. Uh, well done. I mean, this is what I want in these comics, and it's part of why you make a comic that looks like this. Very straightforward, very down-to-earth. Uh, mundane even right because then when you have the extraordinary moments you can make them look extraordinary yeah this does have those elements of like magical realism and you have to have those those normal it's hard sequences. to do it's hard to really you know i mean like most of the time we're going for a 10 all the time yeah and so when you really want that volume cranked up it's hard to do if you've been trying to crank the volume up on every panel you know, all the time. Yeah, go look at a Bern Hogarth uh, Tarzan Sunday when a character's talking on the phone. Looks like uh, some Jack Kirby distortion. It's like, goddamn, pump, pump the brakes, man. The other nice thing with having this John Wayne character is that it's a way to have exposition and characterization without it just being, you know, captions, inner monologue, yeah. talking to yourself. Pretty interesting solution to a problem like that a lot of storytellers face. Right. So uh, the back and forth ha was happening between Tulip and uh god and the conversation is going over and over at a certain point god is you, you know i want jesse to love me too his his grandmother and her cohorts are evil tell him i've restored his power over them uh that he may judge them as he sees fit you know what this is the part that i said call back to this when we get here right because there's there's mention of god working in mysterious ways which is a pretty common you know you don't have to be a, a devout christian to be familiar with that concept and phrase and god uses it here in regards to Tulip asking questions about why is why is this happening this way or whatever, and God brings that up. I do have the one question I have is, if Jesse's really a problem for God and God is able to turn the word of God on and off, Jesse's power, turn it off and then go do whatever you want, God. Like, sure. like if it's not an issue, if there's not a power imbalance there, it's it's a little bit a little bit hazy there you know like like i question grandma's motivation sometimes now i'm questioning i'm questioning god so that uh he works in mysterious ways maybe that line is for me the reader questioning some of these actions uh i mean you might want to put heresy man because you're questioning god <laughs> that's me now hold on <laughs> <laughs> more back and forth man basically this next batch of pages is uh we're, we're putting the battery in young jesse custer's back man uh putting some some pep in his step because he's got a job to do the origins of the until the end of the world uh piece that jesse and, and tulip share is like a little pet pet phrase but it's time man jesse's gotta go learn uh some preacher ways and tc shows up to to uh, corral him. But Thinking guess that what? he's broken. Yes. But guess what? The word of God is back. I, whenever the word of God works on these people, more great facial expressions. <laughs> that ha that happens every, every time that that word is used. And uh, we get a relentless shot of, uh, over and over again, Jess Jesse just uh, smashing his face in. This is that... This is that catharsis part of uh, like action movies, action comics, where... You built so many points up against these bad guys, and now the catharsis is our hero is going to fuck these dudes up a touch. Remember that, Ed, because yeah. when we conclude this story, I want to revisit what you just said. Okay. And there he is, man, our, our, our hero shot. Yeah, he John, took, John Wayne behind him, cheering him he, on. He, he, took, he took care of the weaker of the two, which is what you would want in your action uh, story. 
I love the walk the walk. Uh, all I can think of is Ric Flair. <laughs> Wish he was standing next to John Wayne. <laughs> I feel like there were some double features of them on the old TBS Superstation. More tulip god talk. Great god hand. Yeah, sure. You know, it's it's again like he's kind of shutting off whatever theatrics he was doing, and now you're seeing the the real god. And back to those like bumpkin ass dudes drinking beers, burning their crosses uh, as they do. I guess maybe on a nightly basis. Yeah, what else are you gonna do in the plant plantation? I guess, man. More of our wah wah wah. Yeah, it's a good moment. Confrontation that's sequence. Right out of good, bad, the ugly. Let's see some eyes. Let's see some dudes really looking at each other. Tulip ain't a helpless character anymore, man. She she's back. She's in full effect, and she's gonna fuck up grandma and the little gas canister man the oxygen is always established so oxygen and, and flame go hand in hand jimmy this is a nice repeat the cross motif with the window frame in terms of how you compose your panel sure lock grandma in that room she could barely function that's a pretty fun use of the word of god jesse telling everybody to burn <laughs> yeah you know I, i'm i'm reading this story and and thinking about the end right like is whatever happens to him, we need a payoff. Right. And, and uh, I, I think that's a pretty good one for a lot of these dudes, the burn. Yeah. You feel the motion. That's a great pose. It really feels like it's it's a snapshot of a moment, man, where, where Jody is in full kind of running mode. Still thinking. Not quite in shock like everybody else, man. Still thinking. Uh, he was established by Jesse as being... Uh, wiser than he looks kind of guy runs into a little horse trough we should say at this point jesse still thinks that tulip's dead yes so it, it really is with a uh, heavy heart that he's raining this vengeance down and like your classic action movie stuff our guy jumps into the water and jesse thinks it's over but you know how it goes you can't have uh you can't have that be the end of the guy who Put so much torture on our preacher man. Your next grandma. Turn the page. Boom. There's Jody showing up with a gun. But he dispatches that gun because they're, these are alpha dog hillbilly dudes who want to make a statement when they have their confrontation. Standoff and the final fight when Jody has to realize that uh, he's getting old, man. This is that, that thing where... Uh, you you hear you hear dudes who are dads talk about when their sons get bigger and they they still say shit like, I think that boy could kick my ass, yes. but I can never let him know that. <laughs> <laughs> I can never let my son know that he can beat me up now. This is a strange thing that Hollingsworth does several times where he does this transitional color that has to cross over gray in the middle. You know, like there's a green to a pink. So these are these are complementary colors. And the only way to get from one to the other is to go through the middle of that color wheel, which is a gray. It should not work. He does it frequently. I got no complaints with that panel. Yeah, it's a good like dusk or something. Sunset. Yeah, I like how it looks. It's a nice background. This is like one of those. This is like one of those interesting things where like she's looking at her own blood trail, you know? Yeah. And just thinking about it like, holy fuck. Strange thing to write. That was all in me. Confronts TC, who called her coos and slut and whore a bunch of times. This is classic right out of like 70s revenge exploitation movies. Miss 45, baby, right there, man. Thriller, mm -hmm. colon, a cruel picture. Like <laughs> all... <laughs> <laughs> There's the colon right there. Flashback, man. That same fence that uh, our pup was... Uh, pegged up on we're gonna peg up yes jody and this that's a nice callback by the way the uh the badam this is a wrestling move you distract the the good guy there you know he hears All the right. gunshot and it gives it gives uh jody an opening <laughs> yes <laughs> and that's not a that that punch that's real violence man like his eyes puffing up like the elephant man and that david lynch flick like right away yeah pretty pretty badass for jody there yeah this is so say this is like an unforgettable sequence to me man he hits him with that plank with two nails sticking out it's really yeah it's really good comic storytelling too because you see the whole thing you see the board go in you see the moment of realization and then you get the aftermath yeah <laughs> kind of different it, it it does speak to the 90s audience that 
these were fan favorite characters that that got their own uh, one shot. Yeah, to the '90s audience and to the depravity of Garth Ennis <laughs> and Preacher, <laughs> for sure, man. And when you see that one shot, you you root for them, you know, knowing all this stuff. Good shot of Grandma here towards the end. She just looks insane, possessed, evil. <laughs> The fight keeps going. We got to do our call back, man, to the uh, hammerlock. But Jesse is more wily now, man. All's fair in love and war. Tears a chunk out of his arm, and look at that, man. That's a piece of red meat. Yeah, that's that's Mike Tyson, uh, Vander Holyfield there. For sure. And the little spurts add to it, man. It, <laughs> they he, do. he hit an artery. Hits him with a little Western uh, roundhouse kick. A little Batman Bane gimmick. A lot of Batman reference in this comic. <laughs> and then, uh, ultimately, man, he uses that word at the very end. He wants to make sure. This ain't going to be Jason Voorhees where, where Jody's coming back, man. Fucking die. Yeah, and, and chokes him out with his own two hands, which he says earlier in this story he's going to do. So Grandma's in that room. The fire is, is closing in. Hitting her little oxygen tank. Love the yellow highlights on Grandma's face here, even down to the teeth. I've seen color guides for this. It might be on Hollingsworth's uh, Instagram or uh, comic art fans. Uh, those are floating around. But the color guides, like in his guides, this color's all here. So whatever Copic markers or whatever he was using, it doesn't look much different than the oh, final separated page. I have to check those out. Yeah. And then <laughs> explosion... Call back to almost like Genesis, you know, the little creature that's inside of uh, Jesse Custer. You know, you've seen that baby head go. So she flies out, man, and just like a little comet, man, just a little pile of dust. You see the you see the skeleton in there. Gives a yeehaw because uh, Garth Ennis thinks that uh, modern day cowboys still say that shit. And then Don't just, they? And then just a pile of dust. Maybe it's man. a diehard reference. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Goes into Jody's breast pocket, picks up the fuck communism Zippo. Nice to cigarette. see that come back. Job well done, man. I love those little details from the story standpoint because we we you know there, there's a mythology that's associated with that Zippo. Yes. And here's the re, reunification between uh, Jesse Custer and Tulip. She's alive, and now they are uh, bonded stronger than they were before, man. The the end. Yeah, and I like whenever you have a title appear in the work. Yes, yes. And pretty this, pretty this, good dramatic ending here. I missed some deaths at the end on our list of atrocities. And that's okay, because we just need the bright headlines. So <laughs> so here's here's where we're at, man. And we'll include the ones that you made the hash marks. Five headshots. This is for the podcast listeners out there. <laughs> Five headshots. Seven murders. Burning crosses. Many of those, yes. man. Blasphemy. Page one on that. Violence against women. Incest. Animal cruelty. Child abuse. Two. Markham. Two. Uh... Appearances of bestiality within this five issue sequence. I didn't use, I didn't uh, note them, but there are racial and uh, homophobic slurs as well. Yes, scattered throughout. And uh, I don't know if, if uh, four letter words or something we would have kept tabs of, but certainly this is R rated language consistently. Well said. So we covered uh, some of the stuff that I, I want to yeah. come back to the fight scene. So I yeah. mentioned, you know, like as this bad shit's happening throughout the story, it's, it's, we're keeping a tally in our heads, not of atrocities, but of payback. Right. And that's what we learn from action movies. You know, go ahead, do what you want to the hero. You're going to get yours. That's the way it works. When I get to the end of this, I am not satisfied by the payback that Jesse has inflicted on these characters. Yes, he overcame Jody ultimately, of course, good. But I don't know that Jody suffered the way I wanted him to suffer. Sure. And I don't think he suffered the way Jesse suffered over and over throughout this story at his hands. Same with grandma. Like, that's a pretty... Uh, yeah, it, it sucks to be blown up or whatever. But <laughs> right. Look, she's 150 years old. Like, she was going to go anyway. I wasn't satisfied by this as justifying or paying off the suffering that we witnessed Jesse go through. Right. My takeaway is that is set up for God and Jesse's showdown with God. Like, it's, it's set up for the end of this series of Preacher. It's not set up for this one story. If it were too satisfying at this point, we could just wrap it up here. Sure. This could be the end of his story. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't know that it's a criticism of this story, but it is a feeling that I got after reading this where it was like, I want more vengeance. Sure. We're not done. That's one of those things that uh, some of the great kind of independent works, some of the stuff that makes them great is defying 
our expectations of what we've read in our, you know, hundreds of long boxes of jobber comics that we have. And this defies that. Uh, it's a personal call if it's unsatisfying to you and makes you not like the story or something. Uh, you make a good argument, you know, can't defend it. Yeah, and it's not so much not liking the story because it is a chapter in a bigger story. Right. And, and you know, I, I'm aware of that and I kind of view it that way. Um, interesting to me that Cassidy's not in here. I like Cassidy. You know, Cassidy and Jesse, I think, have a real friendship that not something you see in a lot of comics. There's a lot of comics that suggest the characters should be friends, but I don't feel that friendship. I do feel it in this. And so it's interesting that this chapter, no Cassidy. Yeah, yeah. Which it, makes sense. It, it was it built fits, in. But it's kind of cool that it's like, let me tell a story with these two characters. We're going to break up the three. We're going to tell these two. And uh, and I think Cassidy's arc, that's going to pay off too. I mean, this is a, a love story uh, first and foremost. I, I did not enjoy it as much as I remembered enjoying it. Yeah. Like, like once I'm done and I start putting notes together and kind of thinking about it in the context of the whole Preacher series, I think it's great. Right. Um, but I didn't enjoy reading it on its own. You know, when I read it the first time, it was like, I read like seven volumes of this in a weekend, right. you know, like I was devouring it and it was awesome. Um, I think it's definitely a better experience as a whole. Cool. Um, but I do think it's satisfying in terms of a love story part. Like if you right. think of this as yeah. a love story and not Jesse's origin or yeah. payback or, you know, tying up his loose ends, I think it works really well. And I think it should be interpreted as a love story. I mean, look what it ends on. That's what this comic is. Uh, the arc of the story is uh, these characters are reunited, but they're, they're, um, bickering and a lot of small stuff is in their craw. Uh, there are unanswered questions. Bad breakup, you know, bad breakup. And, and that linger that it casts a shadow over the first volume because we don't get to this resolution. Right. Uh, so it's kind of a slow burn in that regard. Um, the other thing is like, if you guys are paying attention to how this story worked, don't, uh, don't expect this kind of happy ending to continue right. like this is a setup for another arc that is uh if it starts out happy this is classic you know this is story robert mckee's story if they're happy here in this moment well it's going to swing the other way <laughs> as this uh as this series continues on so um i like that you know I, I like this story as a whole yes like i would highly recommend if you haven't read preacher and you're hearing us talk about it we've done a, another video on it um give it a shot start at the beginning and just read this thing because it's a big epic amazing achievement as a monthly comic but i definitely think like ennis had his eyes on the prize right and this is a piece that works as the big epic complete series yeah i think that's well said and a good place to leave it uh you got any more okay favors like follow subscribe to the youtube channel hit the bell we'll notify you when new vids are available what do you got jimmy Join me on Patreon, patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Lots of comics, art, process, behind the scenes stuff there. And currently I'm in the middle of analyzing two comics, same story that I created, Street Angels Dog. So patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. One of the big influences on uh, my Red Room comic is Preacher. So it was fun to give this a reread. And uh, my first two issues of Red Room are available for pre-order at this very moment. First issue is going to come out in May. It's going to be a monthly comic. Every uh, issue is going to be self-contained and you can hit my link tree in the description below this video to get to the Fantagraphics website so you can pre-order those comics. If you want to read those issues ahead of time, patreon.com slash edpiscor. I have all the strips up there ahead of time. For the early adopter, three bucks will get you the archive. I put new strips out every Tuesday. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video to keep up with everything we have going on. 2021 is already busy, so you don't want to miss it. That's goddamn right. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Jimmy, give us some more marching orders. We'll be on our way. Read more comics.